Well, welcome to the Robo Show with uh, your host, myself, Chad Robo Show, and I'm here today with my bro- brother, uh, Mike Glover. Uh, most of you probably know who Mike is. Mike's a retired Special Forces uh, Sergeant Major, uh, the founder of Fieldcraft Survival, an amazing organization doing just, you know, the best out there doing, uh, you know, tactical training, overland survival training, just survival experts. If you want to know anything about survival, uh, they just have an incredible staff. I've, I've you know, been around their staff and I uh, even got the chance to teach one of their programs with them, uh, teach some surveillance detection with those guys. Uh, and uh, just an incredible company. Check them out. Uh, in addition to that, they have a podcast called Fieldcraft Survival Podcast. Um, you know, it's got lots of listeners, great content, uh, and definitely tune in and check out their podcast. And, uh, and I'm um, pressure Mike, just like I did Tim, uh, got a book coming out. I don't know when it's coming out, but I know everybody's waiting on it. So got to push Mike to get, get that book going. Uh, how you doing, Mike? Good, man. Good. I've been busy. How about you? i same, man. I've been super busy, but all just great things. In fact, uh, I was thinking about you on my last trip. I was out at a uh, seven special forces group doing some resiliency training. A few of the guys there, you know, spoke super highly of you and, uh, uh you know, I have a lot of respect for you and, and, um, and just incredible, uh, group of green braids out there. They've been burning the candle at both ends for 20 years and just, you know, doing stuff in Afghanistan, Iraq, South America. And, uh, these guys are hurting out there, man. And I was just really blessed. Uh, blessed and privileged to get out, go out there and talk to them about resiliency and combat readiness. And uh, we're going to be doing more work with them. And so definitely was thinking about you while I was, while I was out there. I got to see the kind of behind the scenes of how the team rooms are set up and how you guys, all the 18 series guys work together and really got a good behind the scenes tour. They took me out the day before and did a, a shoot house and got to sit in the shoot house and the catwalks and watch them shoot. Pr- pretty impressive, man. Uh, you, got, you guys have just an incredible, incredible community of people. Yeah, good dudes. Uh, I love Seventh Group. I love the guys there. I have lots of friends there, and uh, you're right; they are hurting. They need some help, but um, they're doing good stuff always. Yeah, they're still just pushing, pushing forward. And um, hey, um, so one of the things I wanted to bring you on and, and talk to you about today is, uh, you know, so many people. It, you get it a lot. I, I know I get it. Just young folks uh, reaching out to us, asking questions like. What's the type? What's the best special operations uh, unit to join? What's the best branch to join? And you know, my answer is always look at the different jobs. Every special operations unit is different. They have a different mission set, different skill set, and find out which one fits best for you before you pick a branch in the military. And and um, and so that's kind of how I direct people. I think you you do the same. But one of the things that I think we, you and I specifically, could share with the listeners today is. What are some unknown jobs inside inside of special operations? Um, obviously, it's being a Green Beret, being a recon Marine, being a force recon Marine, a Raider at a Bar Sock or a Navy SEAL, a PJ, all these jobs. But inside special forces, there's these unique niche like skill sets and jobs. So I want to talk about some of those today. And and uh, you and I both had the privilege to do some of those. And and uh, to the most that we're able to, because of a uh, you know some of these things aren't public knowledge, but the most that we're able to let's you know, maybe share some insights and some of these inside jobs. Yeah, I think the diversification of special operations is rarely talked about because it's, it doesn't sell well in Hollywood or it doesn't get good ratings because of the, the, the nature of the business that's conducted. It's not as sexy as uh, running and gunning. And so shoot, move, communicate is generally speaking, direct action is what everybody knows special operations to be. But there's a whole side of um, indirect um, intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance elements in the military that every single day are doing the find and fix components of find, fix, and finish. And even part of the finish part, part, uh, we always have to remember, like, we have to find guys, um, and that takes a lot of effort, a lot of resources, and a lot of training to get that capable in doing that, but you got to find guys before you can capture um, bad guys or kill them. And so I, I had the privilege of serving in a, a lot of different positions um, in special operations command because my expertise was reconnaissance and, you know, being a sniper was the first step of that reconnaissance job and mission set. And that was to me, the easy stuff. I mean, being a sniper, shooting a long gun, understand observation, how to retrace and wins, so all that's easy. 
but when you evolve in that job, you start looking at intelligence, you start looking at reconnaissance, um, tagging, tracking, locating bad guys, all kinds of deeply embedded training and more training than I've ever been to out of all this stuff that I've done um, has to do with those skill sets, including trade craft, uh, including counter surveillance and surveillance and a whole bunch of things that are um, technically and somewhat tactically. Yeah. You know, uh, I think one of the, the first that you talked about it is, is the sniper mission. Um, one of the cool things that I've just seen in my community and the recon community is, you know, recon Marines always sent, went to scout sniper school, which is like the big, you know, I say big, like big Marine Corps, it's not a big Marine Corps, but working at, in the, with the alongside the infantry jobs, being that scout sniper. And then they just go back to the recon unit and then adapt their skill sets. But now we actually have our own school, a, a recon sniper course, which, you know, being a sniper in Marine Corps infantry is a lot different than being a special operations sniper, a lot of different skill sets, a lot of different uses for that job. Um, uh, what can you say? What can we say about ASO, a ASO, uh, Advanced Special Operations? Um, yeah, so I, I think we could probably say a lot about it. I mean, that it, a lot of teams that operate um, unilaterally have to be able to do all the major processes of planning and, and execution of operations overseas. So the way that a special forces detachment works is we have different MOSs or diff different job specialties where we cross train each other. So you have weapons, uh, commo, uh, demolitions, and med. But then we have a uh, 18 Fox and a 180 Alpha that concentrate their efforts on intelligence. Uh, a 180 Alpha being a warrant officer who whose job is. Um, the J3X component, so the operations and the special operations um, projects that a, a team would likely have to do. One of the best ways to, to think about it is since the beginning of the inception of special forces, uh, which began when the Office of Strategic Services was um, um, basically shut down in the 50s, we had two major components that split off from the OSS, and that was the Central Intelligence Agency, and that was also the U.S. Army Special Forces Green Berets. Those two organizations split off because you had a whole bunch of operational experience, and we needed a defense component, and we needed an intelligence component. So as these um, um, literal units began to uh, stand up and operate, they realized that they needed to be not only cross-capable of communicating, but obviously being able to take care of their own processes and collecting information and, and doing uh, surveys of drop zones and surveys of critical infrastructure uh, while we were in specific countries and then have plans to execute all of that operational preparation of the environment. We call it OPE. So when, when a special forces attachment goes in and he trains foreign internal defense, there's a big misconception because a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to be a Green Beret because all, all those dudes do is train people. And that's not true. I mean, the, the original um, intent of training people in the first place was access and placement to the country, to the host nation, to the intelligence and information provided, whether it's force protection or deeply embedded intelligence. That was our role. And that role exists. So um, that includes a whole bunch of technical training that you have to get, which means you have to know how to set up observation posts and do surveillance and counter surveillance. You have to know how to take surveys and collect information. You have to know how to do um, photography and, and capture uh, information on, on still photos and video. All this stuff is not, again, the sexy stuff, and most often, uh, and, and, and leading operators, I've seen a whole bunch of operators fail because of their unwillingness to adapt to that understanding. But I've seen a yeah. lot of men excel because they take it as a art and a trade craft and they become an expert in it. This episode of the Robo Show is brought to you by iron-neck.com. Iron Neck is uh, the world's number one neck strengthening device. You guys don't know in uh, 2000 and... Six, I was in Afghanistan and uh, 
broke my neck. And uh, if you want to read about how, that story, a crazy story of how I broke my neck, uh, it's in my book, An Unfair Advantage. You can go and check it out. But coming back from Afghanistan, uh, after that's when I had all my big MMA fights and if my neck and the VA wanted to do fusion and I refused to do fusion and I just opted to just strengthen my neck, keep my neck strong. Uh, so since man, all these years fighting through all my fights and MMA and Jiu Jitsu, I've always been very important that I keep the muscles of my neck strong because the, the bones in my neck are broken off and so I don't have that stability. And so neck strengthening has always been a very important thing to me. I've always just improvised ways to do it using body weight, using different kind of improvised things that I'd make up. But now, uh, I don't have to do that anymore because I have an, an iron neck uh, device, which helps me to uh, not only strengthen my neck, but, uh, but do it in a safe way. The, the way the device works is that, you know, it's, it, it's on a rotator. So it, as you move your neck, the, ro the point of uh, where the tension is actually moves uh, around your head. And so super uh, effective and safe way to strengthen your neck. And whether you have a neck injury or not, I think in, uh, in sports or just in, in, in life, it's really important to have a good, strong uh, neck. If your neck's strong, your hips are strong, your body's going to be strong. And so check it out, iron-neck.com. If you enter promo code ROBYSHOW, uh, R-O-B-I-C-H-A-U-X, my last name, you'll get 10% off. And uh, I'm really doing this because I, I love it myself, and I want everybody out there, especially those with bad necks, to be able to take care of themselves. And so I really thought it was a great product to push out and partner with. And uh, these guys are pretty awesome. They're a Texas-based company, iron-neck.com. You know, I got the opportunity in, in uh, 2003 to try out for a JSOC task force and get picked up. And uh, uh, didn't really even know what I was doing, like what I was trying out for. And then I later learned that I was, you know, going to be trained to be an AFO, Advanced Force Operator. And um, this is something that not only did I not know existed, but I didn't even understand you know, the job I was getting into or, or understand what it was. And when I discovered this world of AFO doing clandestine logistics to put operators on assaulters, what everybody imagines special operations to be on target and then making sure they safely had all the, you know, had all the local national um, resources and assets and, and, and ability to get off target safely, you know, safe houses and contingency plans and, um, you know, local national vehicles and permits to get in those areas medical supplies, blood, water, you know, all, all the stuff, you know, local national, uh, lo local weapons and ammunition, all the stuff that I'm like, this is the coolest job ever. And I was just so happy that I, I you know, kind of just stumbled myself there and ended up being there and just fell in love with that job. And then I lear later learned that no one else wanted that job. I was like, I thought it was so cool. And I was so excited to be here, be there. And I thought I was like super special to make it there. And then I realized none of the guy, other guys wanted that job. None of the guys at my, the assaulters and my, you know, the command I was at wanted to do that job. And that's how I got there. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's not sexy, but I think that's the eyes of the beholder or, you know, the perspective you have. I, I, you know, I think that's like super sexy job, but again, you're not, you know, always kicking down doors and shooting people in the face. You're, you're facilitating those things to happen. And it's, but it's just such a necessary role. When you really look at the big picture of it, it's, it's, it's a super cool uh, place to serve. And, uh, you know, it takes a special kind of person to do it. Yeah. I, 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 I gravitated always towards that job because I knew at, at some point with being part of JSOC, that AFO was going to be a big piece of my guy's jobs. Uh, and, and my and my role as well. And so I had a staff role in, you know, in briefing and planning and organizing my guys to be successful in the battlefield. And, and that, again, is not sexy sitting in an office punching uh, PowerPoints and, and, and briefing ambassadors and generals. But it's it's so necessary because, I mean, special operations, the, the cool thing about special operations is it's full spectrum. You get everything you get every aspect and every component in a very small form factor and when i hear people say oh special forces green berets they're they're a massive unit it's like no they're not man they're small comparatively when you look at their resources um you know the 75th ranger regiment has in, entire battalions uh, entire organizations augmented to support them they have joint special operations command that provides a lot of the support for them the green berets and special forces as a regiment doesn't have that kind of support and, and they have to fend for themselves. So 
being a jack of all trades was what I did in special operations and in ASO. Nobody wanted to do it um, in early on, which I kind of get. But as you evolve as an operator and you want to become very diverse, it's something that you're going to have to learn. Yeah, I believe if, you know, if you're out there and you want to be able to have the opportunity to make, you'll be given broad tasks to make big battlefield decisions, especially as an enlisted man, um, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a, a place to pursue and go. And if you want to go off on your own and, you know, wander the mountains and the, the dark alleys of, this, of the, you know, third world cities and um, really make sure that, you know, we're able to catch the bad guys and put, and put our guys on target. And, and uh, it's just a, such a cool, cool job. And I, I definitely recommend guys, that, you know, either entering special forces or, or special operations in general or with that, whatever branch or, uh, or if you're already in and you don't really know about this field, just, you know, definitely it's, it's uh, an area to consider serving in, especially if you're like, you know, super like intellectual type person and, and like the independent uh, ability to make decisions on your own and, uh, and take on those responsibilities. I think, it, I think it really is a cool place to serve. Um, hey, what, what do you, you know, we throw the word around tier one, uh, tier one special operations all the time. And I think a lot of people don't even know what it means. Can you define what tier one is and what makes it different than the other uh, special operations? Yeah. I mean, by the book, it's, it has nothing to do with the actual guys. I mean, by the book, it has everything to do with lines of logistical, um, uh, support funding enablers, um, and then priority when, when it comes to, um, the national mission force, um, doing hostage rescue overseas or, or even in the United States. So it has more to do with the timeline in which people are able to respond and their ability to have enabled support to make that happen. Um, yes, it does reflect in capability as well. But what I've seen, for example, um, you know, the 75th Ranger Regiment, which is technically considered a tier two unit. Um, when you say that, specifically civilians go, oh, you're, you're just tier two. And I don't like that. You know, I, I don't like, I don't even like s stating that because technically speaking, Special Forces and its hierarchy and USASOC and JSOC is a tier three unit. And so when you, when you look at that hierarchy and as it relates to the capabilities of the guys, it, it mostly has to do with um, hostage rescue response and not a lot to do with battlefield effectiveness because the 75th Ranger Regiment and its command is the most effective fighting force on the planet. Because of the support and resources they have, ability to get on target and do, get, do the job quickly, right? Yeah, I mean, a combination of a lot of stuff. I mean, I would say the start point is the best small unit leaders in the world. Um, I mean, you have a, a hierarchy of um, a ranger assessment that filtrates on, on the initial startup, a school called Ranger School that um, everybody in the Ranger Regiment, even if you're a support L, uh, uh, pack, should be ranger qualified, um, you know, and – and that is impactful because you're creating a standard and then you're creating an esprit de corps and the men and then breeding the most highly effective small unit leaders in the military, which, which by the way, most services don't do. I mean, the Navy doesn't have a protocol for outside of the SEAL um, community to, to raise leaders from the ground up. You're subordinate until you're in charge and that could take you a decade before you become in charge. In the infantry and combat arms and in the army specifically, including the 75th Ranger Regiment, you're bred as a private to be able to take over, understand the plan and execute the mission. That's very different than other uh, sister services. And so when I, when I think about tiered units, uh, I, I only think of it from a logistical, mainly a logistical and funding perspective and less a uh, individual or unit capability. Yeah. And one of, one of the last things I want to talk about, and I think you guys, when I say you guys, I mean the, the Army Special Forces, probably does the best job at it is, you know, one of these specialty skills inside of special operations is the, our medical guys. I mean, in the, in the recon community, we have a SARC Special Amphibious Reconnaissance Corpsman. Marine Corps doesn't have their own corpsman, so we, uh, we get guys from the Navy. And these guys, 
I mean, they do everything we do as re, as recon marines, except more. I mean, they they go through the pipeline, so they go first they go to they go to Navy corpsman school, become corpsmen, and then they go to field medical school and become field medics uh, for the Marine Corps, and then they go to BRC to become a recon marine with all the other. They don't do any other uh, anything different. They do everything we have to do, and then they go jump dive sear free fall and and uh and then they do the full year army 18 delta uh medical course i mean these guys are spending you know over two years in the pipeline uh to be able to be embedded in our team and do everything we do plus provide that you know just life-saving medical medical uh support and uh you know i think no way does the job better than um the army for training these guys for that and i just think it I think, you know, for younger guys listening to us, if you want a really unique special skill and that's there, you have a heart to, or a desire to serve in that way, that's, you know, it's an incredible role, uh, kind of specialty role inside special operations to do. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the reflection on a long career in special operations, uh, I, would, I would say that being a special forces medic is probably one of the most impactful but also um, um, follow on from your military service, relevant mm -hmm. jobs in the in the career field. Um, not only do you get trained um, and and stop the bleed and basic battlefield trauma, but you also get trained in in field surgery and veterinary um, services that you would provide overseas because you're building rapport. How to run clinics, all the uh, standard things that you see in people, but also what you see in war. And so, um, to be honest, if I could go back and do it again, I would have became an 18 Delta. And then I would have become a special missions unit medic because I think the best uh, profession is being a medic and the relationship you have with the men, your ability to be on um, every single target set um, you need a medic everywhere. You need a medic on the X when you're hitting the target. You need a medic in low vis operations. Um, but also, I would have took a, a career field in getting my PA, um, uh, becoming a phys physician's assistant, or maybe even becoming a medical doctor working for special, uh, Joint Special Operations Command. It's such a, a beautiful career field, and there's so many different things you could do in, in that s specific job. I have a good buddy of mine, Mark Donald. He's a. Uh... <laughs> Navy Cross recipient, and he, you know, went in the Marine Corps. Went in the Marine Corps as a recon Marine, and saw that side, and said, "I want to do that." Became a, became a, uh, a SARC to become a go back to recon as a corpsman, and then became a SEAL. As a, it went to 18 Delta, then went over to Dev Group, went to Physicians Assistant School, was a, was a main medical officer over at a got a, got commission, and then he went over to Ground Branch as a medical officer at Ground Branch. Wow. Uh, as, as a SEAL, he just had, he just took every opportunity to do that. And actually he got his silver star in Navy Cross, bronze star, silver star, Navy Cross, purple heart. Uh, he got his uh, Navy Cross while embedded with ground branch. He was an inc incredible guy, but he, his career was just amazing. Just really pursued that. And then, you know, we have to give props out. We were talking about a subject of the PJs. I mean, the PJs are incredible medics and, uh, and a, a really unique role. If anybody's out there looking and you have a, you're really considering going that route, you know, the medical route and special operations. I'd say, yeah, you know, yeah, you can't mess the PJs. The PJs and pararescue guys are incredible. Uh, special Forces, 18 Delta, and then, um, and then of course, the uh, uh, SARC, which talked about Special Amphibious Reconnaissance Corpsman. Uh, those are just three good routes to look at. Any other, any other ones out there? Uh, but your SEALs, the, the SEALs have it. Yeah, they still have, they, they, they use, you mean, they go, they go to the 18 Delta pipeline as yeah. as part of it, but it's like a uh, uh, only a segment of the school. Um, I would also recommend just throwing that out there. I, I actually look was going through some I Love Me book stuff, and I was on uh, looking through paperwork, and I actually found my Joint Terminal Air Control Certificate mm. that um, gave me my identifier. And I was probably, I think at the time, I was maybe one of three guys in all third group that was uh, JTAC qualified going through a course uh, that was built for Green Berets and different different uh, services to get JTAC qualified. 
And that was an incredible job as well. I mean, be, being on the battlefield as a sniper in a hide, being able to get on the radio and call for fire uh, or call for cast or for air, close air support, it was a huge uh, opportunity for me and, and, and something that's really cool that a lot of people don't even realize that they have. Like, we, yeah. we don't just use combat controllers. I mean, I was a qualified controller as a sniper in the commanders and extremist force. Yeah, I don't know how I missed that. That's it. Yeah, it is when you talk about special jobs inside of special operations, being a JTAC, Joint Terminal Air Controller, is a, uh, I mean, you could do that combat, you could do a combat controller over in the Air Force, uh, and which embed with, you know, with all, all of our the other special operations, or you could be, you know, just JTAC qualified within, you know, as, as a operator. But, uh, man, it's great job. My son, Hunter, who, you know, uh, was a uh, Anglico Marine Anglico and, uh, who does that, that job embeds, he embedded with the Georgians and, and then provided air fire support missions over in Afghanistan. But yeah, great job. Uh, I mean, kind of cool to, as a sniper to put a bullet into a bad guy uh, from before, but, Dropping a 500 pound bomb on a whole bunch of bad guys is, I think, a little, a little bit cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like both. I like both. <laughs> hey, we're we missing any more with, with uh, as we wrap this up? Um, I think we so, when, when I was in special operations, we actually had a mobility team, and um, a mobility team specialized in driving different kinds of vehicles. SMUs uh, uh, um, also have these kind of teams which are specialists in vehicle acquisition. So stealing vehicles, which I've been to uh, probably three schools, how to break into Like vehicles. vehicle commandeering type courses, the common, I yeah. went to BSR, I did a commandeering course. Yep, how to steal a vehicle. Um, I went to uh, a course in uh, New Hampshire on how to break into vehicles, how to steal vehicles, but also how to drive vehicles. Like I've been to, I mean, I've been to Blackwater, driver instructor school, BSR. I went to uh, Team O'Neill Rally race car school a few times. So it's a lot of cool things that you could do in special operations. And even specifically for mobility and being able to go um, and, and literally sit in anything and drive. Um, yeah. I, won't, I won't mention the details of this because it, it is a sensitive program. But we even have a special operations program for operators to be able to fly a uh, rotary wing at fixed ring yeah. aircraft. So as enlisted. As an enlisted, as enlisted as well, right? Yeah. 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 I've seen those, uh, man, I, I went to BSR too. Like every year we go to BSR, do the, the driving training. And then, uh, and we do the, the commandeering course, which is stealing vehicles and selecting yeah. selections for vehicles. And, you know, man, it's really cool. But one of the hardest things, I don't know if you had this problem, but we were staying out in a hotel in town and, all day you're on the track driving like a NASCAR driver and now you have to get in your rental car <laughs> <laughs> and drive like a, drive like a sane person back to your hotel. It was yes. like the hardest thing. <laughs> yes, it is. I, you I doing an entry, many entry memories. apex exit. <laughs> many, many, many memories of taking rental cars and, and not being kind to them after those training courses. <laughs> I, I was I came home and I had a little Corolla and uh, and I took my kids out in the parking lot. It was raining. I'm doing J turns and reverse 180s, and then my <laughs> my kids ran at me out to my wife. <laughs> so like funny, I'm practicing. <laughs> so funny and so much fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, man, uh, you, you're doing incredible things. As we wrap up, you want to share some of the stuff you're doing and how some people could some people listening could follow you and get tap, get tapped into what you're doing. Yeah, it's, mostly it's just philcraftsurvival.com. I mean, you can get access to all our links and all of the stuff that we have going on. So just go to philcraftsurvival.com. You can get ported out to your to our podcast, our YouTube channel, our blog, our social media feeds. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff um, this year. We're pushing hard on mobility, uh, overlanding, because everybody's getting outside now and getting back to uh, some sense of normalcy, uh, but also focused on family preparedness and self-reliance so we, we want people to focus on cutting the umbilical cord from institutions and for de from dependency so they could be better prepared and um, taking that path is a way to get set up for that um, I, I don't like depending on anybody for anything and so it's just a natural um, progressive course and to getting yourself squared away and being better prepared yeah the, the world is a unstable place to say the least right now and um and the way to have peace and comfort beyond that is readiness. 
Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, you, you, some of the best, you guys are some of the best at providing information on that. Man, it's so great. It's super, super proud of how you guys are doing in Utah. I want to get out and visit you. And, and I, have, I have something coming up. I'll talk to you offline uh, about just inviting you or something. So, uh, but uh, yeah, tell all the guys hi for me. I will, man. I will. Thanks for having me on. You bet, brother. 